Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, so my name is Will, and I'll be talking about uh, the Long Island Zoning Index, which is a zoning map that we're creating for Long Island um, in New York State. Uh, unfortunately, my colleagues couldn't be here. Um, they did a lot of the sort of data pre-processing in QGIS. Uh, they worked a lot of magic before the, the data got to me. Uh, but feel free to ask questions, and if I don't know the answers, I'll, I'll forward them along to, to my colleagues, and I can um, put you in touch with them. Uh, so I'm from the uh, CUNY Mapping Service at the CUNY Graduate Center in New York. So we uh, make maps that look at different, um, at different kind of civic issues around the city and around the state and uh, sometimes around the whole country, uh, the United States. Uh, so for instance, we're making maps around uh, where people can put in their address and see who their uh, government representatives are, um, we did a lot of work around the, the census in 2020. Um, so it's directed by Stephen Romalewski. Valerie Bauer is the GIS specialist, and I'm the software developer. So I'm kind of taking all the, all the data that they give to me and figuring out how to put it into a web map that is, um, performs OK, hopefully, and is, is usable and communicates the underlying data. So uh, the Long Island Zoning Atlas, this is, uh, we're still developing, we're still developing it, so this is uh, preliminary. It, all of this, all of the layout and everything is subject to change. But just to give you a sense of the general um, scope of the work, um, so there are housing groups on Long Island uh, who are advocating for uh, affordable housing and um, so we're working with um, them and uh, a lot of different stakeholders uh, to make a map that looks at the uh, zoning types so where uh, first where residential housing is permitted and then within that filtering for where um, accessory dwelling units are allowed, uh, where multi-family multi housing is allowed, uh, and then looking at some of the, the demographics uh, underlying those areas. Um, and then we also have a, a lot of different overlays, so you can look at uh, for a particular zone, who the um, government representatives are, uh, what school district the zone falls into, uh, so looking at a lot of the underlying data too. So some, just a list of our, our supporters here, uh, some developers, local banks, um, and affordable housing advocates. Um, so again, this is sort of what the map actually does. Uh, I think I've mostly covered this. So with the challenge, uh, the, so Long Island is just one small part of New York State, but it has uh, two counties and uh, 15 towns and cities and about 100 uh, villages and hamlets. So there's, we're getting zoning data from a lot of different sources. Uh, some of it is, some of these are very small towns, some of them are big, some of them have different kinds of uh, zoning methods. So uh, for instance, in the, the top we have uh, Brookhaven, which is large, and it, uh, their zoning ordinance specifies that the zones don't include streets. <laughs> so I'll get into this a little bit. This is one of the biggest headaches we've had uh, in terms of performance because it makes the, the number of, of vertices in the geometry just explode when you have to trace out every single street in every single zone. Uh, and once you optimize for that, then maybe, you know, then it's not as optimized for some of the smaller uh, zones which have, some of them are, are tiny and only have like 100, 100 points. Uh, we received 
if we were lucky, shape files. <laughs> if we were a little bit less like, l lucky, then we got PDFs. And if we were <laughs> very unlucky, we got scans of paper maps from some that were that are older than that are like 30, 35 years old. <laughs> uh, like I mentioned, some of the zoning regulations include streets, some don't. Uh, the zones are non-contiguous, so sometimes there's a main zone in the middle of the town, but then there's another part of it that's up in a corner somewhere. So when I submitted this talk, I thought that I would come here and I would tell you some brilliant solution <laughs> that we came up with. This is our pipeline, this is how we do it. And the more we've worked on it, the more I've realized that that is just not how this works. <laughs> There's no magic solution to this. The, the solution is just a lot of time and effort um, and finding kind of hacks around different problems that we've come up with. So an uh, overview of our stack. So we have uh, QGIS and, and uh, Postgres to ingest the data and store it. Uh, then we are using uh, Node.js API that's forked from the Dirt Simple Postgres uh, API, which is great. Uh, it's very easy to, to extend and work with and modify. And then on the front end, I'm using Vue, uh, MapLibre, MapPutnik, and we are hosting the base map uh, from Mapbox. Um, and this is kind of what we're using the different components for. So uh, QGIS and Postgres um, for the digitization, some of the cleaning, uh, the, the ingestion of the data. Uh, so the API is taking is making um, tile requests directly to Postgres uh, and I've come up with kind of a custom caching solution to the to uh, work with the disk cache so it's uh, yeah um, and we've also used it to to kind of group certain layers together, so I'll get into that a little bit more about why we've uh, taken some features that have a lot of points and put them on their own in their own layers and taken then a lot of uh, small features and put them together in a layer. So we've tried to kind of spread the, um, the workload of, of the tile requests. And then on the front end, I'm using Vue, Vue.js and MapLibre. Um, so the digitization process. Uh, these are examples of some of the scanned maps that we've gotten. Some of them are uh, tiny for, for tiny villages. So the village of Thomaston, for instance, has 1,000 1, households and nine zoning districts. And Russell Gardens is only, or only about 1,000 uh, residents. And then we have very large uh, townships and municipalities that we're dealing with. This is a scan um, for the village of Freeport. It's 30 years old, or 30, 35 years old, 36 years old. Uh, the, one of the challenges with digitizing this is that obviously they weren't thinking when they made this map of, about digitization, uh, so there's cross-hatching filling in a lot of the, uh, the zones, and that makes it difficult for the, um, to, to kind of automate. So there's been some manual cleaning up and um, to, yeah, to, to handle that. So the API is, um, we're using it to connect to the database to Postgres. We're using um, ST as MVT, uh, uh, queries to generate the tiles. Um, I have considered uh, pre-rendering the tiles. Uh, we, there are a few reasons that I haven't done that. Um, one being that uh, it, it, it does make it easier to develop as we're, as we're kind of building out and testing different parts of the app to be able to uh, not have 
the tiles baked because we're still kind of figuring out what data we're putting in. But also the, the zoning ordinances do get updated every so often um, and it's kind of unpredictable. So we may get, we, we basically have no idea when we're gonna have updates that we're gonna need to make. Um, so I found that it's easier to get them straight from Postgres and then cache the, the tiles as needed. Um, like I mentioned, uh, the performance, the, the tiles when I first uh, tried to, to do this were enormous um, because of particularly the, the zones that had the streets carved out. So what we did was split the zones into, we sorted them by the number of points and then we grouped them. So there's a group, so we tried to have layers of roughly the same number of points to kind of spread the, the tile request load. So we have uh, some of the, I think Brookhaven is something like 20,000 vertices and that's on its own layer. And then we have all, a lot of the smaller uh, features that are grouped together uh, in their own layer. Um, uh, the disk caching, uh, I've come up with kind of a custom solution for disk, cache, for disk caching, disk caching um, which works, but I'm, I'm also investigating some other solutions that are a little bit more robust, uh, like Redis. Uh, uh, so we attempted to use ST Simplify to simplify some of the, uh, the geometry. There are a few reasons that this is a problem. One is it just didn't help that much. <laughs> By the time we, we got it to the point where it was helping with the size of, these, of the tiles, it was uh, so uh, low resolution, it was not useful. And also this is, we have a disclaimer on the site that says if you're using this data to actually move forward with a project, here's the link to the actual zoning ordinance from the town. So this is the primary source, so use this. Um, but we do want to make our, our data as accurate as possible. And so ST Simplify, we were a little unsure whether that would compromise the, the um, validity of, of the data. Uh, so, in terms of styling and um, presenting the, the data, so uh, we're using uh, Matt Putnick to style a style JSON, and there are a few uh, kind of hacks that I've come up with to make this go a little bit more smoothly. So, because we have so many different tables with different zoning ordinances, uh, I have a script that automatically updates the style JSON whenever a new table is added to Postgres. So it'll look at the table name and, and fill in the source. So that way when, my, when me or my colleagues are going in and, and uh, styling the map, we don't have to look and manually add every single table one at a time as a new source. Uh, and then I made a lot of use of the Matt Putnick uh, comments. So. There's a, it's, it's outside of the official MVT spec, but there, there's, you can add comments inside layers and tie that to metadata. And then I created a separate JSON file that has metadata for each layer that just makes dealing with it in the app a lot, a lot simpler, a lot more straightforward. Um, transform requests. This is partly to help with performance, but it's also something that I've really tried to leverage in all of the apps that we're making. It's so useful to be able to um, take requests to, we have our dev Postgres instance and our production instance, and so to be able in the app to just automatically say, okay, is this dev or production, and then transform all the um, HTTP requests accordingly, super helpful dealing with keys too. And then we also have some legacy uh, ArcGIS uh, layers because we made a similar project to this about 10 years ago. And we have raster data uh, specifically with uh, around land use. And so we're using, um, we had to use transform requests to, to 
uh, deal with the, those kind of older uh, APIs. So yeah, so the rendering time was really uh, caused a lot of headaches. Um, yeah, so uh, again, I think I've already mentioned splitting the layers to try to um, even out the, the load of the tile requests. Uh, we, there's also, just because of the way that WebGL works, the, um, when you select a zone, we wanted to highlight it with an outline. If you use an outline layer and, and turn that on and filter it, some of the larger zones take, what was it? It was like a minute to render. It just un unbelievably long. So it's much, much faster to use the fill outline if, you're, um, if you want to outline something. The downside to that is because of the way that WebGL works, those outlines can only be one pixel thick. So um, there's kind of a trade-off. And then also looking at the data that we want to load when you load the page versus what we want to request. And again, this is a really tough balancing act because some of the districts, if all, if, if all of the zoning districts were you know, 20, 20 points and the geometry was small, uh, we would probably figure out how to balance this in a little bit of a different way than uh, for districts that are thousands and thousands of, of points. Um, so it's really just trial and error and, and poking around and seeing, OK, this performs OK on desktop. What about mobile? Maybe we need to um, tweak things here and there. So next steps. Um, this is kind of just what, I've, what I'm looking into next, how to use web workers to speed things up on the front end. Um, I, yeah, so uh, maybe there's, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to load some of the data um, like asynchronously. Uh, and then coming up with more of a, a pipeline for, for simplifying and ingesting the geometry. I guess like I mentioned before, there's no uh, magic bullet solution here, but to standardize it as much as we can would be really nice because when we get updates from these towns, we're gonna have to put them through this pipeline and ingest it again. Uh, and this may be in a week, and it may be in five years. We don't know, so we don't know what formats we may use. Um, and then exploring other APIs. I've really enjoyed working with um, the Dirt Simple HTTP server. It's, it's just very easy to, to tweak and, and develop and make extensions for and make your own queries. It's, I love it, but I think there are other APIs that have been, that people have already done the work to make them more robust and um, secure and, uh, you know, uh, OGC compliant. So I'm, I'm researching some kind of if any of the, the existing options would work better than what we're using. Uh, and then also the caching, because right now it's kind of a, uh, this custom cache where it's just saying it has this uh, been, has this tile been requested already? If it has, then get it. If it hasn't, then save it as an MVT file on our server um, hard drive, which yeah, it works, but okay, thank you. Uh, the, um, you can follow uh, Steve at SR Spatial on Twitter, and I'm on Mastodon at WIJFI at Fastodon. So thank you. Thank you.